layups and performance hacks. And I hope you enjoy the show. Dr. Cordain, thanks so much for taking the time today. Really honored to have you on the show. How are you doing today? Good. How are you, Dr. Bubbs? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I'd, uh, I'd love to kick things off to talk a little bit about how you first got interested in Paleolithic nutrition. I've, I've heard you mention the research paper by Dr. Boyd Eaton there in about 19, late 1980s had a, had a big impact on you. Could you take us back and, uh, and walk us through how that affected you? Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I've always been interested in, in diet and health and fitness and nutrition. And I received my PhD from the University of Utah in 1981 and was promptly hired uh, here at Colorado State in their Department of Health and Exercise Science. And when I got to CSU, my research interest area were in human performance, body composition, and diet. And so I, I had pursued that and had a number of research projects involved in that area. And in 1987, roughly six years later, uh, I happened to cross uh, Boyd Eaton's classic paper that appeared two years earlier, 1985, in the New England Journal of Medicine called Paleolithic Nutrition. And I thought, wow, this is the greatest idea I've ever heard of in terms of optimal diet for humans. And so I read through that paper and I ended up, <clears throat> it had about 80 references to it. And in those days, the internet didn't exist, or if it did, nobody used it. And uh, I went down to the <clears throat> our library at CSU and I looked up uh, virtually all of those cross references in Boyd's original articles. And I read those. And in the day and age, you had to to get information, they didn't have PDF files, so you had to Xerox them, the articles, and then bring them back to your office and read them. So that was the process, and I... Um, <clears throat> Racked up quite a bill there with the photocopies, I imagine. <laughs> yeah, well, I think it was five cents a, a, a per page in those days, and I used to get these cards, and you'd you know, you put five dollars on the cards, and then you go down and and Xerox them. <clears throat> so I ended up uh, getting all of these articles, and uh, the idea just fascinated me. And uh, so I started to see patterns um, that Boyd Eaton had pointed out. I started to see patterns is that with the articles I got as cross references is that um, ancestral humans. Uh, didn't eat grains, they obviously didn't eat dairy products, and they obviously didn't eat processed foods. And so <clears throat> as I was gathering together this information, I would uh, I, I put it first together in just a, a single uh, manila file folder that I call Paleolithic Nutrition. And uh, that file folder rapidly got bigger and bigger, so I had to subdivide it into to topics of grains and dairy and salt and refined sugars and so forth. And it's kind of like, uh, you know, when I was a kid at Christmas time, we used to put together uh, jigsaw puzzles. And it, what you do uh, doing that is that you put together the obvious, you put together the outside pieces first, and then you fill in the, 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 the middle. And so I kind of, uh, for an, al an analogy, I kind of saw myself doing that, is that I filled in the outside pieces, you know, the, the obvious, and then I started putting together the interior. And lo and behold, after, I don't know, I want to say three or four years, I had an enormous uh, number of articles that I had Xeroxed and uh, Put into file folders. I had these steel cabinets that I started to organize the whole thing into, and uh, I really started to see the picture that not only were the the outside pieces come into place, the interior was becoming clearer and clearer to me. And so, at the time, I hadn't published any scientific papers on the concept, uh, but it was kind of a hobby, something I just had thought about. 
And so I got up enough courage to call Boyd Eaton. And in those, in those day and ages, it's not like it is now where you can jot off an email to anybody anywhere across the world and gotcha. say, here's what I am. So yeah, I, sure. I got on the t- I got on the telephone and I had his number and he was down at, uh, he was at Emory University, but he actually was a, a private radiologist at the time. So I called his office and I called him right around noon because I thought, well, this would be a good time to get a hold of a, of a practicing, you know, radiologist. He might have a little bit of time on his hands. And lo and behold, he dropped everything and he spoke to me. And we had about a one hour conversation, maybe a little bit longer. And at the end of the conversation, he paid me the the greatest uh, compliment <clears throat> I've ever had in my, my professional career. And he says, it sounds to me like you know more about this stuff than I do. <laughs> nice. <laughs> <laughs> so at the end of the conversation, um, I, I can't remember where it went, but we eventually, I invited him to come to Colorado State University and make a presentation. And so he came up here and he made a presentation. Uh, I had just been married. Uh, we had him over to our, our little tiny cracker box house in those days. And uh, my wife, Lori, and I hosted him. He's a perfect gentleman from the word go. He's just a great guy. And so that's kind of how the whole thing began. And <clears throat> he told Artemis Simopoulos, who was a fairly famous scientist in the days. She's a woman, um, and she was very much into omega-3 fatty acids in the day. And so she was hosting a conference in uh, Athens, Greece, uh, the very next year. And Boyd got a hold of her and said, hey, you got to get this guy to come out and, and talk. And so wow. I didn't even have a passport. I didn't even have a passport. In those days. So lo and behold... It, it all um, kicked off. It all kicked off, and I went out to to Athens, and uh, I met um, the Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare at the time, and was hobnobbing with uh, some of the the greatest si- nutritional scientists of the day on a bus as we're traveling through Greece. She put us, gave us a two week vacation, going to the to Peloponnesia and and it was just a wonderful time and uh, you know things just kind of took off from there and uh, I got into the science of this whole thing I started publishing articles with uh, Boyd Eaton he obviously was my mentor and um and if I can if I can jump in there Dr. Cody one one of the um you know, one of the the areas that you talk about in your in your books and in your writings is this idea that you know human nutrition has no organizing universal paradigm like in you know geology with the continental drift theory or in cosmology with the Big Bang theory. So, can you talk to us a little bit about you know this idea of asking the question why and why humans have nutritional requirements because that seems to be a, a big underpinning of this whole uh, paleo ancestral approach. Right. That <clears throat> that was exactly it. <clears throat> Pardon me. As I started putting the pieces of the puzzle together, it became obvious to me that uh, humans are no different than any other organisms, is that we are shaped by the environmental selective pressures uh, in the the environmental niches in which we occupy. And so um, our nutritional requirements are shaped within that realm. And that became uh, an organizational template for me. And as I wrote about in my books and elsewhere, um, that this was the overall organizational template that would guide contemporary nutrition uh, to more healthful uh, dietary patterns. <clears throat> and so that's, that's really how the, the whole thing came about. And one of the questions I often get asked by by docs or nutritionists or trainers is this idea of, you know, how do we really know what Stone Age people ate? And I know you go through that in your books, but could you touch on that a little bit in terms of the studies on primates and fossils, et cetera? Well, I think, um, you know, the biggest issue is we know what they didn't eat. Gotcha. And exactly. 
from there, from there, you can deduce what they did eat. And obviously, they didn't have refrigeration. They didn't have, uh, you know, industrial processing. They didn't have foods available from all over the world at all times of the year. They had the fresh foods that were available that could be hunted or gathered. And so that is kind of the starting point uh, that Boyd had made, and it's the, the starting point that I have made. Now, clearly, we can't, you know, as 21st century humans, we can't obviously eat in the manner that our hunter-gatherers and ancestors ate. And by the time they <clears throat> our ancestors colonized the world, they ate in many, many manners, and ate an incredible variety of foods. But the point is, is that they ate foods that were sta standard deviations beyond what we eat now in terms of certain nutrients. And so that really is what uh, um, the, I think, overall philosophy of this quote unquote contemporary paleo diets has become since, uh, you know, uh, Boyd and me and Stefan Lindeberg and a bunch of other guys got together in the <clears throat> early 90s and, and started writing about this. And when we look back in terms of the Paleolithic hunter-gatherer ancestors, and, you know, another question that often comes up is this idea of, of you know, were they healthier even if they died at a younger age, which is obviously different environments. But can you touch on that in terms of what we know from the research? Yeah, my... Uh, one of my graduate students and uh, people that I totally respect is, is Pedro Bastos, and uh, uh, he's from Portugal. And we, we wrote a paper about two or three years ago that, uh, you know, addresses these factors and kind of brings together what Boyd had written and what I had written earlier. And um, from all available evidence, um, you know, Obviously, they died early from uh, things that don't get us, like childbirth and snake bites, and, you know, warfare. Uh, you know, For sure, being and, exposed to environmental things that, uh, thankfully, we don't right. have. Right. So well, if you were to camp out, I don't know where you're from, Dr. Bubbs, but uh, think about it. it Leave your interior environment and camp out for the rest of your life. Oh, for sure. And, and you know, it's... It, it's a, it's a, it's it would be a tough thing. So the environment tends to take us all, and definitely. And so um, I, I think that it's difficult to separate uh, the environmental factors from nutritional factors that seem to adversely affect our health. But you know, it, it, as best as we can, we we know that um, contemporary studies of hunter gatherers before they are westernized, and, you know, that goes back to the 17th, 18th, and 19th century, and even into the earliest 20th century when we could take measurements like cholesterol and blood pressure and, and what have you. They, um, our ancestors, as they aged, um, didn't seem to uh, exhibit the risk factors for cardiovascular disease, cancer, and so forth that we now have. And... Um, putting two and two together, you can see that they didn't have these dietary factors that tended, we know now, to increase risk for a variety of diseases and because they couldn't get them. Um, so yeah, and you so that, that, that's basic philosophy. And I, I think that's one of the, the areas where um, the contemporary paleo movement has been hijacked by people who are non-scientists and who haven't read the, the scientific literature, who haven't done the studies, but, you know, on the internet, anybody can say anything they want. And Definitely. it's just who has a, a louder voice. And loud voices that seem to dominate uh, on the internet these days are incorrect. And so in the waning time of my career and my life, I've tried to correct uh, that information. But 
you know, it's kind of like a fart in a hurricane. <laughs> sure. It's tough, it's, isn't it? It's like there's so much, there's so much misinformation. And one of the biggest pieces of misinformation is salt. And uh, so that's kind of one of the areas that I've been focusing on over the last couple of years. My colleagues, my scientific colleagues that are still alive, we also are focusing upon that. And um, can you tell us a little bit about the um, the the current research there and around sea salt? Because as you mentioned, I know you know salt's obviously just been something that's sort of dovetailed into the paleo um, approach, and rightfully so or wrongfully so. And so, can you can you give us a an update on, on, on what your research has been finding and, and where that stands in terms of, you know, is, is avoiding salt for all people the, the ideal, or if we're more athletic and more fit, is there a place for, you know, sea salt? Let me just give you, let me just give you what people need to understand is Perfect. that, um, the data should always speak for itself. You shouldn't rely upon a charismatic person like a Rob Wolf or a Mark Sisson or a Chris Kresser, those people are human and all humans have foibles. All humans make mistakes. So what is best for people to rely on long after I'm dead and gone and all those other guys are dead and gone is to rely upon the information that will always be there. And all you have to do is examine it. You can examine it a hundred years ago, 10,000 years ago, or 10,000 years in the future, because it will always be there. And that information is the sodium content of foods that we eat. Now, you can go out and you can choose 500 fruits, 500 vegetables, 500 meats, 500 organ meats, eggs, and, you know, even non-paleo things like wheat and dairy and you name it, any food you want and examine it, it's sodium content. And I defy you or anyone else that's listening to this uh, conversation, I defy anybody to show me how you can obtain more than about 2,000 milligrams of sodium per day with any reasonable combination of non-adulterated natural foods. It's impossible. There's a couple of exceptions, and I will, we can talk about those, but they would have been foods that would have been rarely eaten. So if the data says that unadulterated natural foods, which is what paleo diet is all about, you can't obtain more than 2,000 milligrams of sodium, then people like Chris Kresser who are claiming that we can eat up to 7,000 gram or 7,000 milligrams, seven grams and Mark Sisson and Rob Wolf and the others. It's like what I, the question I pose is where did salt come from? Where in the hell did you d eat, get that salt? Because no natural unadulterated food contains sodiums at, at levels of, of roughly about the level that the, um, you know, American Heart Association, the, the USDA, and all the other governing bodies all suggest we ought to eat about less than 2,300 milligrams of sodium per day. That's a, that's a great idea. Oops, sorry, keep going. Well, and, and the, the kicker of this whole thing is, is that when you eat natural foods, if you eat fruits and vegetables and meats and fish and nuts and, and all the rest of what's considered to be paleo in this day and age, not only does it give you a very low dose of sodium, it gives you an absolutely high level of potassium. And the way our kidneys function, again, this is physiology. So, so this, is, this, is, this is not a charismatic individual like a Chris Kresser or a Rob Wolf or others that are telling you it's okay to do this. This is, this is the data speaking for itself. And so when you eat, and you can look at this, anybody can do it right now. People, if you've got a computerized dietary analysis program in front of you, you can, you can put in a thousand foods and you can see that it's impossible to get potassium lower than sodium. Potassium is always higher than sodium. And our bodies function quite well when our potassium levels are higher than sodium. 
But when we abrogate that, that basic physiologic principle that is shown to us through, through evolution, then we have all kinds of health problems. And, uh, you know, it, it seems to affect people differently through lives through their lives when they have high sodium, low potassium. But by the time they get to the end of their lives, it affects us all. And that, that, that's the whole issue. Uh, that's so true. I mean, in, in definitely in clinical practice, as you mentioned, I mean, processed foods are just a vehicle for sodium consumption. And it's definitely one of those ones where once we start getting that out of the diet, uh, it's amazing how that ratio starts to fall into balance. But a couple quick uh questions on that note for you that I mean, ketogenic diets are more popular now when we look back to that ancestral idea evolutionary idea of um, having to look around for food for extended periods of time um, people tend to see improvements when they add more sodium so I'm just wondering how much this would relate to a evolutionary adaptation of a ketogenic diet versus having to add salt to a, a current ketogenic diet to help people feel better you know I, I don't think that we have any uh, contemporary studies that actually have examined, um, you know, ketosis under high or low sodium uh, concentrations. I think it's a good question, uh, but as far as I know, there is no data that shows one way or the other. What we do have is across the board, across the board. The normal plasma, okay, plasma is the liquid part of blood. The normal plasma concentration of sodium lies somewhere between about 135 millimoles to, at the extreme, 150 millimoles. So if you eat pickles and olives and anchovies all day long, you can get up to that 150 millimoles. If you eat unadulterated foods, you're down at about 135. And the range of plasma sodium concentration goes up and it goes down depending upon how much sodium you get in your food, regardless of whether you're eating a ketogenic diet or not. And so my point is, is that the higher the plasma sodium concentration is, the greater your risk for overall mortality is, and your, the greater your risk for cardiovascular disease. Now, mortality and cardiovascular disease don't take us out until typically we're in our sixth decade. So it's, it's a difficult experiment to perform, so we have to do it with prospective epidemiologic studies. And um, those data have been published, and uh, they're incontrovertible that higher salt in the diet increases plasma concentration of sodium in all people. Absolutely. Now, how it affects ultimately depends upon your genotype. It depends upon a variety of, of other factors that enter into the equation. You know, nutrition and, and, and is, is complex. That's how it relates to health and diet. But there's no doubt that a high salt diet through the course of a lifetime is a risk factor for mortality. And now for the listeners out there, I know you're, you know, 85, 15 rule. So if someone is adhering to, you know, solid nutritional principles, lots of vegetables, et cetera, is, is the occasional on that 15 side of things, adding a bit of sea salt foods for for those people that are doing everything right. You know, is, is that, would that be okay? Well, you know, so I, I mean, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Question it's, it's like, you know, you have to live your life the way you want to live it. And we don't live under Stone Age conditions by any means. We have temptations that surround us, you know, daily. And so you have to live your life uh, in a manner that behaviorally is something you can do versus something that you can't do. So the guy that goes into his high school 30-year reunion and refuses to drink a beer or eat a piece of, a slice of pizza with friends that he's had his whole life, you know, that's a, a temptation that, you know, why? 
because you, you may walk out of that high school reunion and get hit by a bus as you're crossing the street. Exactly. So, <laughs> gotcha. So, you know, you, you need to uh, uh, kind of waver how you want to lead your life versus reducing the risk for chronic disease. And so that 8515 rule, actually my wife came up with that when I wrote my first book back in in 2000, um, is we, we decided kind of collectively that, you know, you can't tell people for the rest of your life, you can never have another glass of wine, you can't ever have a, a pickle or whatever. So we kind of threw that in as a modern day um, caveat to making this diet more palatable. And it seems to me that uh, people who eat about 85% to 95 to 90% of their calories generally as paleo foods, unadulterated fresh fruits, veggies, meats, nuts, seafood, sea and so forth, um, are probably going to be healthier than people that just eat the standard American diet. Absolutely. For anyone listening, I mean, that 85-15 rule, if you, if you take that over the course of a seven-day week and average out three meals a day, I mean, you're still getting three meals where the, you can loosen the rules a little bit. So like you mentioned, it's very uh, very manageable, very doable. Now, the next question that the salt dovetails into is, again, on this sort of myths theme is around bacon and paleo, because that's definitely another one where the two have sort of merged together in the popular um, yeah. popular blogosphere. So maybe you can, you can uh, dig into that a little bit for us. Well, you know, I've... Uh... On my uh, website, I, I've written blogs about this, and so people can go to my website, www.thepaleodiet.com, and in our search engine, type in bacon, and you can get way more information reading that article than I could give you on a, an interview. And I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with eating a strip of bacon every now and then, mm -hmm. but people to think that uh, daily bacon consumption is not a problem, is completely wrong. And, uh, you know, that kind of misinformation is what is out there producing, you, you know, go on Amazon and, and look up The Paleo Diet, and you can see there are books on eating bacon, butter, and and whatever, and eating, you know, chocolate. Uh, paleo and eating paleo cookies it's just it's absolutely ridiculous and so with our modern technology we can produce foods that mimic the taste characteristics of uh you know contemporary junk food with paleo ingredients but they have all the characteristics that junk food has and so Bacon is junk meat. It is crap meat. It's had very little characteristics with fresh meat. I live here in Colorado, and if I were to go out and shoot an elk right here in the mountains behind me and eat the meat from that wild animal and then contrast the nutritional characteristics to bacon, it's a joke. It's like night and day. So if people want to eat bacon, fine. Let them do it on the 8515 rule and do it occasionally. But don't eat bacon every day and don't think that bacon has anything to do with this concept that Boyd Eaton, myself, Stefan Lindeberg, and other scientists who are either dead or, or about my age that are no longer with us, it, it, that's not paleo. And it, it never was. And these books that are written and you can see them all, you can get chocolate or brownies. There's a book on how to produce brownies, <laughs> paleo brownies. <laughs> it's just totally and, 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 burn, right? It's, uh... and, yeah, and it's like this, this is a total prostitution of an idea that we came up with that was it, was, it just started with a group of scientists uh, and we didn't call it blogs. We had there was another name for these these things that we spoke to each other on the very beginnings of the internet. 
and uh, listservs. That's what they called them. They called them listservs. And so we used to correspond with one another. And I, you name the scientists that was involved in this movement, we were all talking to one another through listservs. Uh, Jenny Brand Miller, Boyd Eaton, Stefan Lindeberg. Uh, we were all talking to one another, and it was a very small group, maybe 10 to 50 people. Uh, and I think those listserv, uh, you know, the transcripts of those listservs still exist. And you'd have to be a little bit clever to pull them up. Uh, but that information formed really the basis uh, for this contemporary movement that is now absolutely gone viral. <laughs> it is just, it has become beyond my wildest ma imagination and it is it has gone beyond what the scientific community had proposed that it was going to be absolutely i mean it, it the diet itself dovetails in with what we see in, in clinical practice today which is a lot of hyperinsulinemias and the downstream effects of that in terms of all types of chronic diseases and i know you know leading cardiologists like dr asim alhatra um, is, is very big on on the you know, carbohydrate and sugar impact on obviously insulin and therefore, you know, cardiovascular disease. I know you've written a lot about hyperinsulin anemia. Can you, for, for me as a clinician, one of the major benefits of this way of eating is that it's very simple to follow and it really addresses this kind of root, root cause of, of chronic diseases. Um, can you, can you speak to that a little bit more? Yeah. You know, it's, we're, we're spending billions of dollars, uh, you know, in the U S health, uh, promotion field, you know, the U.S. Department of USDA and blah, 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 and everybody else tells us, well, we really don't know what's causing the obesity epidemic. We don't know what causes diseases of insulin resistance, but we do. It's very simple. Stop eating processed foods, refined grains, refined sugars, refined vegetable oils, and salt, and all the other foods that are made with those foods combined, and I, I include dairy products there too. So if you stop eating those, what's left? Fresh fruits, fresh vegetables, nuts, seeds, fresh meat, seafood, fish, eggs, and so forth. And, and so if, if you, you put that out there and say that's, that's the diet, that's what humans have to eat, Oh my God, you're going to cause all sorts of nutritional deficiencies, Cordain. If you take out dairy <laughs> foods, you're going to be deficient in calcium and this and that and so forth. And so early on in the game, you know, I've been playing this game for 30 years. So early on in the game, I decided, all right, let's look at what a diet looks like when you take out dairy, processed foods, grains. And we published an article way back in the 90s. And we ran it through computerized dietary analysis. What does it look like? My God, we ran three or 400 different diets with all sorts of permutations of those few ingredients and pulling out the rest of the ingredients. And what did we find? We found out that it was more nutritionally dense than the best diet that the USDA could come up with. The, the USDA recommendations, the Mediterranean diet, the Japanese diet, it came out so far ahead of all the trace nutrients that we know humans require. And I think that's a very poor way of looking at diet, just nutrient by nutrient. But if you even play that game, it came out so far ahead, uh, it, it was beyond reproach. And a lot of that seems to come down to the, the dietary recommendations that were given, in, I believe it was around 1980, that were based on Ansel Keys' work around this idea of cholesterol being a, a marker for cardiovascular disease and poor health. And it almost seems like at this point, because those were laid down, we, we, we can't get above a certain amount of dietary fat in the diet without causing alarm in the in medical or, or dietetics communities. Um, can you speak to that information in terms of cholesterol, um, total cholesterol uh, its, its impact on health and, and and why it's so difficult for these organizations to wrap their head around the fact that we, you know, we need to be able to shift some of these macronutrients. Well, you know, I, I, I realize I'm, I'm talking to kind of a lay audience here and uh, I don't want to get into, you know, some of the heavy science of the whole thing, but um, 
Uh, let me just just step back and talk about the cholesterol issue. Um, cholesterol is a waxy alcohol, and it's found in the membranes of virtually all animals. We have to make cholesterol. Cholesterol is a, an integral part of the membranes of all of our cells. And so if you eat animal food, you're going to get cholesterol. But your body makes cholesterol anyway. And so the cholesterol content of bloodstream is fairly tightly regulated. Liver tends to control the cholesterol level of the bloodstream. So it, it tends to rise and fall slightly with dietary cholesterol. Um, but the notion that cholesterol, dietary cholesterol influences plasma cholesterol is a joke. And we know this through um, mathematical manipulations of cholesterol. And so if you take large groups of people and you feed them just cholesterol without saturated fats is that dietary cholesterol ha has the least effect on plasma cholesterol of any of the fatty nutrients that we eat. And so um, this is, is known through what's called regression equations. And if you look at regression equations, uh, they come in different forms. But generally speaking, there is a A, an alpha, a beta, gamma, and so forth, parts of regression equations. And the equations that were developed by Ansel Keys and others show that dietary cholesterol is at the absolute bottom end of these regression equations. So you don't have to be a, a, a lipid scientist or anybody else. You can be a mathematician. You look at the equation, you say, this has no effect or minimal effect. Dietary cholesterol has minimal effect on plasma cholesterol. So that kind of eliminates the idea that pure dietary cholesterol has no effect. And let me give you an example. For instance, at one time in the, I don't know, late 60s, early 70s, they told people that had heart disease they shouldn't eat shrimp. Shrimp is incredibly high in cholesterol, but it's low in saturated fat. And when we finally got around to evaluating shrimp per se as an individual item in the diet to see what it does to plasma cholesterol, it turns out incredibly high in cholesterol, but it doesn't do anything to blood cholesterol levels. Okay, end of argument. That should have been known when scientists first look at, at the regression equations that described it. But apparently some, but somebody missed that. Or maybe somebody in graduate school forgot what regression equations were and how they're built. Well, it's interesting so, you say that. I know um, Dr. Zoe Harcum just completed a, a, a robust research that um, – as you're mentioning, I mean, even Ansel Keys back in when he was doing his research had, had admitted so much, but that message, like you mentioned, that loudest horn getting all the, the sound was uh, lost in the wind. And of course, we ended up down this road. So I definitely encourage all any of the GPs that are listening in, um, check out Dr. Gordain's writings on this and Dr. Zoe Harcum. I'll, I'll put a link in there as well, because it's definitely something in clinical practice that this idea of cholesterol being increased is just an underpinning of how, you know, cardiologists and other docs are having to treat their patients. So definitely... Um, appreciate your insights there. Bob, I'd like to want, point, point out one point and kind of tie it around to what I was saying about salt. Perfect. Is the, the people that speak loudest in the paleo community, they don't even know what regression equations are. They don't even know what an alpha error is, a type 2 error is. They know nothing about statistics or research design. And if you don't know that information, you can't adequately evaluate any scientific experiment. And so if you spend a career and a lifetime doing it, you know that information and you know the foibles that come out with scientific studies. So what's the difference between a retrospective, a prospective, a randomized controlled trial, blah, 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 blah. The average person doesn't know. But that's the bread and butter of a research scientist. And so looking at um, sodium, looking at sodium, it's the same deal. Yeah. If you don't understand 
the subtleties of experimental design, you can't interpret the studies properly. And so that's, so that's, that's the analogy is the same thing with cholesterol. If you don't know what a regression equation is, how in the world can you even begin to state what this factor is? So mm -hmm. my point, my point is, is that if you rely upon nine non-scientists to um, provide you with the interpretation of scientific experiments, you're, you're at a loss. And so that's why people that are listening to your broadcast should rely not upon me or anyone else individually on any charismatic individual. You should rely upon the data. The data always speaks for itself. That's a terrific advice, and I think that's on that note, you know, the data really supports that in terms of hyperinsulinemic being a big issue in chronic disease, as you've written about, is just a real major underpinning. Um, and so this, this obsession with cholesterol is really is really distracting uh, from, from that underlying root cause. Now, if we, if we shift gears a little bit to um, hunter-gatherers, sleep, circadian rhythms, um, obviously very different than today's modern world of artificial light um, and some of the comforts of home. Can, can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, what that would have looked like from an ancestral perspective? Well, let's talk a little bit about sleep. Um, as long as we're talking about sodium, in 1945, an article appeared in the Journal of the American Medical Association. And it, to my knowledge, it is the only knowledge or the only data that um, examines sleep, restlessness, ability to go to sleep, and salt. And it was a robust article at the time because it was a double-blind crossover, which, you know, I mean, that's the, that's the gold standard of doing scientific studies these days is a, a double-blind, a randomized double-blind crossover. And so with the randomized double-blind crossover done as far back as 1945, they reported that people who stopped eating salt, whose sodium intake went below... I don't know, 1,500 milligrams, um, you, you know, it absolutely improves sleep. So, uh, you know, you talk about circadian rhythms and, and so forth. Um, one of the things that we do is that our sleep cycles seem to be regulated by areas in the brain that are affected by salt. So, uh, and today, you know, obviously the salt uh, question is is a, is a massive one factor. Um, even the exposure to, to to light in the evenings. I mean, I know from the research and uh, hunter gatherers this idea of and you know getting to bed obviously not too long after sunset, and in winter months getting to bed even earlier than in summer months. Um, can you speak to a little bit of that circadian mismatch and how that can impact you know health and, and perhaps that's some of the low hanging fruit? You know, I really I'm not really an expert in that area, and so. I, I think that I'm, I'm not the best person to speak to that other than saying that uh, whenever there's a question about health and environment, uh, I think the best approach is to look at the ways in which, you know, humans have always done things. And that tends to provide us with a clue as to how we should do things. So you talk about hyperinsulinemia is that everybody eats a, a high glycemic load diet in the Western world, unless you're, you're consuming a paleo diet or, you know, you make an effort not to. So everybody eats a high glycemic load diet. So everybody ends up, if you do that for a lifetime, everybody ends up looking like Donald Trump. <laughs> you know? Yeah. He, he's, he's, he's obese. You know, he, he's trying to, to, to fool us all into saying he won't tell us how tall he is. He won't tell us how, much he weighs and so but you know from what he does tell us is that you can calculate his body mass index his bmi and he's right on the borderline or beyond the borderline for obesity and so people that uh, have unhealthy bodies that have high bmis they tend to, every organ in their body tends to be unhealthy absolutely 
before we wrap up, kind of touching base on some of your more, most recent research, which is the nutritional strategies for skeletal and cardiovascular health. Um, you know, hard bones, soft arteries, rather than the opposite, which is what we tend to see in the general population. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that or sort of summarize some of the key findings there for, for people, for docs and nutritionists out there having a listen? Um, actually, that data comes um, from James O'Keefe and his group. I, James O'Keefe is a world-renowned cardiologist uh, from Kansas, and uh, you know, he he's the one that primarily came up with that. Pedro Bastos was on that article, and those guys just kind of threw me in as a <laughs> leftover. So I, I don't take claim for it all, but I, I do believe in it, and I think that. Uh, the evolutionary data tells us that drinking loads of milk and eating cheese and yogurt and so forth, yeah, it's an incredibly rich source of calcium, but that never happened under an evolutionary paradigm. Nobody ever drank milk or ate cheese or yogurt or anything else simply because you can't milk wild animals. You hear in Colorado to go out, and, <laughs> go out and try to milk one of these elks up here in the mountain or mule deer or a buffalo or bison, it just, you can't do it. Um, so that means that you don't really have these incredibly rich sources of calcium. One of the problems with having high levels of calcium is it tends to oppose magnesium in our body. So when we eat normal uh, foods, fruits, vegetables, meats, and so forth, there is a there's a ratio of calcium to magnesium, and there's a, as I mentioned, it, with all human nutrients, there's a, a mean and a standard deviation, and there's an area under the curve. And so when you look at nutrition like that, and you look at the standard deviations for any nutrient, uh, it's difficult or impossible to go beyond two standard deviations. So a normal bell-shaped curve is you know, one to three standard deviations. I hope you learned that somewhere in your schooling. Absolutely. Um, oh, so when you see a nutrient that is now three, four, five standard deviations above normal, that completely sets off, uh, uh, you know, an alarm. It's that, 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 that couldn't have ever worked. That couldn't have ever been part of the uh, system that shaped our, uh, physiologies and so that's really the problem with with dairy products is that they enormously boost the dairy the calcium to other uh, you know elements particularly magnesium um, potassium sodium and so forth so you know I think that when we talk about building healthy bones, healthy bodies, and health, healthy musculature, that's something that we do as a reproductive strategy to make babies. It's like when yep. you're in your, tw your teens and your 20s, that's what your body is trying to do. It's becoming muscular and fit and healthy for the environment uh, so that you can reproduce your kind. And, uh, you know... As we age, all of those systems that built strong muscles, strong bones, and so forth, they tend to decline. And what I can say is that we cannot change that decline. We are all going to die. We are all, all of us, our muscles are going to get weaker. Our bones are going to get less strong. But what we can do is we can attenuate the slope of that curve. And going back on the final issue is cellular senescence. Cellular senescence is the process that happens to all cells, whether it's a bone cell, a muscle cell, a testicle cell, or anything else in your body. The cell changes. The cell fundamentally changes in terms of its electrolytes, in terms of its ability to respond to hormones and so forth. And we know in isolated cell cultures, if you expose the cell culture to salt, it changes the telomere length. 
Okay, telomeres are structures in cells that, uh, after so many replications, 50, 50 to 55 replications, telomeres, they start out long and they get shorter and shorter and shorter. And mm -hmm. then when telomeres are at their shortest, the cell expires. And so we know from uh, ex vivo studies in cells that salt rapidly increases aging of cells and it causes a shrinkage of telomere length prematurely. So for those people in the paleo community that are advocating salt, counter that argument. Gotcha, definitely. Now, with, with the respect to bone health, I mean, an often misconception from, from docs and even the nutritionist's idea of you know, animal protein intake um, being detrimental to bone health when we see some you know, tremendous amount of research, mm -hmm. nurses' health study, et cetera, showing protective effect. Can you speak briefly to that? Yeah, you know, we, we think about um, uh, dietary protein in terms of what it does to calcium excretion. And so if you look at it only from that perspective is that if you increase the protein in your diet, the amount of calcium in your urine increases. So that's called calciuresis. And... Uh, the problem with that concept is that unless you measure the amount of calcium that you're absorbing, then you don't know what's really in the bank. So if you, you've got a kid, a teenager, and he's spending all of this money, and it's all going out, but if he's got money coming in, the balance is still, <laughs> is still the same. So what we're, we're more interested in is not how much calcium is going out when we increase our protein, but how much we are absorbing. And it turns out that uh, uh, higher protein increases calcium absorption. It also increases a hormone called IGF-1. IGF-1 tends to promote uh, the process that builds bone cells. So even on high protein diets, High protein diets tend to or seem appear to be uh, diets that are uh, promote bone bone health and, and bone strength. And that seems to dovetail with what you've obviously seen in the and, and noted on in terms of hunter gatherers intake of dietary protein, which is in around that nineteen to thirty thirty five percent range. Correct. Um, right. So. When you, when you don't have uh, cereal grains and you don't have refined sugars and your re refined vegetable oils, uh, you have to rely upon uh, energy-dense foods in a wild environment. So we, all of us are so far removed from a wild environment, we don't even understand those basic principles. But um, if you were to shine everything and go out into the Colorado Rocky Mountains, and I'd say, okay, Dr. Bubs, you only have the food that you can <laughs> gather here. You know, you're going to be a world of hurt. And I do like camping, broccoli, but I don't think I can. I don't think I can go that far. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> if, if, if if there happens to be a, a, an asparagus patch down on the river, uh, you know, and the river is six miles away. You're not going to hike six miles to get 35 calories of asparagus. It just it doesn't work, and that's called optimal foraging theory. Mm -hmm. So, so what you do is you try to maximize your energy output versus the energy input, so that you have balance in the bank, and that's in terms of calories. And so, if there is a small animal like a squirrel. You can run around and chase it. If there's a smaller animal like a mouse, you can run around and chase it. But the amount of squirrels and mice that it takes and your energy output to capture them is not very productive. And smaller animals have less body fat than larger animals. That's called scaling theory. So what you tend to do if you're in a 
wild environment, you tend to try to go after bigger animals because bigger animals have more fat and they're more dense, uh, more calorically dense than smaller animals. And so that's exactly what our hunter-gatherer ancestors did. They sought out uh, larger animals because they were more energetically dense because it, you got more bang for the buck. You got more calories for the energy that you put out. Um, Absolutely. So, yeah, so, so that kind of, that strategy is long lost. I, I guess that anybody that gets a degree in nutrition these days, uh, you know, evolutionary medicine and, and this kind of thought is not part of the deal. You just push a cart down the grocery aisle, get yourself a ham, get yourself some chocolates, and throw them in the cart. And no more energy expended just throwing in a ham or a, you know, a head of broccoli. It's just all the same. And well, I know once we... Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, I know Dr. Stefan Guinea's work there and just what you mentioned, this idea of in the, our current environment, it's so artificial in the sense that we don't have to, ex we used to have to expend all this energy to get, whereas now we have to expend very little energy to obtain these really calorically dense foods. So our brains are still hardwired from that ancestral evolutionary um, system. Indeed. I, I think that's exactly how things go. And, and to, to get to the salt issue one final time, I know I'm hammering it dead animal here, but uh, <laughs> right. hard, we're hardwired for salt. It was very rare. Salt and sodium was very, very rare in our ancestral environment, and it does have survival value. Um, it's just that we couldn't get it in anything. And so when we did get it, we, we sought it because it did have survival value. The same way with sweet foods, like with fruits and what have you, you know, we seek out uh, sweets because Typically, the foods that have sweets are high in vitamins and minerals, and they only occur, you know, seasonally. So, uh, you know, we're hardwired to eat things that are sweet, things that are salty, and so forth. But when you have an unlimited supply of sweet and salties, uh, it turns us into what we are now, a nation <laughs> in which 66% of everybody is overweight or obese and our president is leading the pack absolutely well you know now we're up to about 50 percent are pre-diabetic or diabetic so just like you mentioned it's uh it's sending us down the wrong direction now i want to respect your time here dr cordain just the last couple things here before we let you go um you've written Alrighty. about coffee recently now i know coffee is a huge you know in terms of uh, popularity beverage wise and and another perhaps myth of being brought into the paleosphere, but can you talk to us a bit about your new writings and this, you know, this idea that coffee might be sort of a, a neutral uh, overall? Yeah, you know, I, this is kind of the work that comes from my uh, graduate students that work with me. Uh, the first graduate student that worked with me when I just was getting into this in the late 80s is a fellow by the name of Mark Smith, and he got his PhD at Colorado State in uh, physiology and the last student that uh, was my graduate student was Trevor Connor and he got his master's degree from me I don't know I've been retired for three or four years so he was the last student and so both of those guys work with me right now and uh, Mark was largely responsible for working on the coffee article I did a little bit of research on it and what I can say is that, uh, you know, meta-analyses are, are studies in which scientists put together multiple studies, and sometimes they put together what are called descriptive studies. Sometimes they put together randomized controlled trials in meta-analyses, and then it depends on the type of descriptive studies and so forth. And these are the subtleties of research design that... Um, non-experts like our charismatic paleo bloggers don't know the difference, absolutely don't know the difference from one to the next. So these are the types of studies that we rely upon to try to, you know, make sense out of studies that can go one way or the other. So one day they tell you, uh, you know, pizza is good for you. The next day they tell you pizza is bad for you or whatever. Yeah. So with coffee, um, you know, there are studies that 
go one way or, or studies that go the other. So the way in which scientists try to make sense out of these studies are by examining meta-analyses. And there's a specific st set of statistics that are used to ex evaluate meta-analyses. And basically, you know, it's, it's kind of cherry-picking a little bit in, in terms of how you include a study in a meta-analysis or not. But um, the meta-analyses tend to indicate that coffee drinking probably is uh, okay in terms of cardiovascular disease, cancer, everything else, and it may actually be slightly in the benefit. There are some randomized controlled trials that suggest that coffee may adversely affect uh, blood glucose and, and so forth. But from an so so basically, it's kind of a a crapshoot. It doesn't seem to really have a negative effect one way or the other. Um, and so people like coffee. People tend to eat coffee. And this goes back to the same eighty five fifteen rule. Definitely. How do you want to live your life? You know. And like coffee, and it seems to be working for you. You know, I would say go for it. Now that dovetails into my last question, Dr. Cordain, which is basically, can you tell us a little bit about your morning routine? You get up, what is it? Uh, is it tea or water or coffee or what, what's breakfast look like for you? What's the morning routine? Yeah, I've never been a, a coffee or a tea drinker. I, I've never drank coffee in my entire life and I've never drank tea. So uh, <laughs> that's not part of my morning routine. No worries. Um, water it is then? When I was a, a young man, uh, my morning routine was to get up and run five or six miles in, in the morning. That was the first thing I did. I used to love the springtime here in Colorado, is to get up when, with the sun and go out and run the streets before anybody was up. Unfortunately now, uh, after many skiing injuries and fights with my brother-in-law, <laughs> my knee no longer, my, my ACL, my medial collateral, and all the other things that go wrong with your knees when you get old, uh, don't allow me to run anymore, but I, I, I still enjoy walking in the morning. And so Lori and I walk. We usually walk after breakfast. Breakfast for me is a um, fresh bowl of fruit. And in this day and age, you can get fresh fruit. I don't care where you live now. Any, any time of the year, you can get fresh strawberries. <laughs> when I was in graduate school, when I was in graduate school, you could only get fresh strawberries, you know, in the spring and summer, and that was it. Now you can get fresh strawberries because of international flights. You can get them all year round. You get blackberries, blueberries, uh, cantaloupe, you know, anything, any kind of fruit you want all year round. So uh, I enjoy a bowl of fresh fruit, and uh, typically uh, sometimes I eat a little bit of left over from the night before, which could be uh, fish or meat. And oftentimes I just like a couple of um, soft boiled eggs. So I, I, I soft boiled eggs because it, it tends to minimize the oxidized cholesterol. If you put a bunch of eggs in a frying pan with a bunch of um, oil, what it tends to do is it tends to create these compounds called oxidized cholesterol, which are a lot like salt. They tend to increase the senescence of cells and make cells um, age faster. So, uh, you know, and, and whether or not that will have anything to do with my own life, man, I don't know, but uh, they taste good to me. And so I have a couple of um, soft boiled eggs in the morning full of fruit and that's usually my morning routine and then Lori and I go out and we try to put in a three to five mile walk uh, with our dogs and all of our kids are out of the house now so well that sounds like uh, a pretty uh, fantastic morning routine <laughs> and definitely a good uh, leading by example is always great to see um, Dr. Gordain, massive thank you for for coming on